Hello and welcome to the lecture DBD Object Tracking for the Master in Computer Vision Barcelona. This is for the 2020 edition. My name is Xavier Giro and I'm an associate professor at the Universitat Politecnica de Catalunya in Barcelona. This lecture has been built with collaboration with Andreu Girbau, who is a PhD student of uh, our group at UPC. Actually, he's an industrial uh, doctorate and he's working at Automatic TV, part of Media Pro. If you want to know more, I encourage you also to watch this video lecture from Laura Leal from Summer in Barcelona, and as I like the previous edition of this uh, same lecture um, one year ago in this very same master. Here you have the outline of the session. You see that first we'll uh, explain what's the main um, problem we're trying to solve with object tracking, and then get into uh, the first steps with trying to solve this problem with new networks, then present correction filters, bulk regressors, tracking by detection, end-to-end -end solutions, and finally, a brief mention to tracking with language. So let's start with the motivation. Object tracking is a challenge in which we want to assign a unique ID to each object of interest across a video. In its classic setup, the object tracking problem assumes that we already have an object detected, an object of interest, and we want to uh, follow it in a consistent way in terms of ID across all the frames of the video. In this sequence, you can see how a bounding box is located over Usain Bolt in its, this race. Normally, uh, object tracking is visualized with bounding boxes around the objects. See here a live example of a state-of-the-art algorithm on object tracking recognition. This algorithm is called DeepMod. We'll briefly mention it in the future. And you see here the problem. You see how there's a bounding box over each pedestrian, and also there's a track that um, behind, like kind of that um, track leg, sorry, that shows where the pedestrian has been in the previous frames. So this is the problem that we are trying to solve. There are actually different flavors of object tracking um the basic most basic one is when we have just we want to focus on only one single object and we really only that during all the whole analysis of the problem on the other hand maybe we want to find a solution that takes into account um, different objects at the same time the, then in that case we talk about multiple object tracking and an even more uh, complex, but maybe a uh, real problem, we have multiple objects, multiple targets, which are captured and recorded from multiple cameras in such a way that we can see different views of the object either from um, position or as well in time. For example, here you see an example from the ACC challenge, would you see cars taken uh, from different cameras at different crossroads. If we focus in single object tracking and multiple, compared to multiple object tracking, as I mentioned before, single object tracking, SOT here, will not take into account the appearance of the rest of the in the scene, which will make it very difficult to disambiguate. Also, in addition, if we consider a deep learning solution in which we focus in this talk, um, single object tracking is very expensive computationally, as we would need to um, pass over the network each of the objects that should be processed. You will see that in the lecture, um, there are many examples on uh, multiple object tracking, it's a bit more generic single object tracking case one. 
in terms of terminology, there's this concept of triplet, triplet, sorry, which that shows uh, that it's the a fragment of the track that follows the moving object. You see in the figure on the left how there are different objects which are being tracked. And you can see that these objects are being tracked because we can visualize the track legs, so the previous uh, positions in this example of the bottom, uh, center bottom part of the box in previous frames. In this case, of course, we're assuming a static camera. On the other hand, on our right, we can see the distractors, which will be like other objects of interest, or oh, sorry, other objects, or other salient objects uh, in the scene, which might uh, confuse, which might make great trouble to our algorithms with respect to the object of interest that we want to track. So as previously mentioned, just to make sure that we are all clear on this. We will assume that for the tracking problem, um, mostly there's a first and some kind of detection as a first step. Step, or sometimes uh, this is already provided in a, especially in, in scientific benchmark, like a first bounding box that expresses where the the object, which of the object of interest we should track. Uh, later, that main challenge is to infer a track leg over multiple frames. Uh, in many cases, you'll see that by simultaneously detecting and tracking the object. So we need, we will not only just create the tracker, but also um, surround the object with a bounding box, which will be like the object detection task. There are and there have been uh, several data sets and challenges with all these presented problems, both the single object tracking, multiple object tracking, and the uh, multi-camera one. So in terms of single object tracking, uh, one of the first benchmarks was the online tracking benchmark. There, there was the object tracking, um, as well as benchmark and data set, as well as tracking net. So these are some of the data sets, standard sets of the VR you may want uh, to take a look if you are interested in the single object tracking. A very popular one um, of these data sets was ImageNet VID from for video, which was part of the world famous uh, data set for uh, static images. So in, in the same effort, in the same uh, the same organizers or uh, authors of the ImageNet data set, they also uh, promoted the collection of uh, video part of image, maybe not as popular, in which uh, the objects were uh, detected, localized with a button box in the video frames, and also like uh, tracked across frames. So you see, like you can find like some works that are using this data set. Another data set that in the last years has received some attention is the YouTube bonding boxes because of its large uh, size and well over there you can find videos and bonding boxes across the the objects that you need to track if we focus on multiple objects there's a this very popular benchmark called mlt which has been adopted and used uh, for with uh, by many authors actually this this data set is also part of one of the current uh, challenges that are running on CPR this year. Now that we have defined which is the main problem that we want to address, let's take a look at the first initiative that somehow use neural networks to try to solve the task. One of the first works is, was from 2013. And it used a multi layer spectrum as part of a, 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 a completion of a denoising multi layer perceptron autoencoder, which means that um, basically this is an architecture that is used for learning features in a fully unsupervised or self supervised way, if you want to put it like this way. So, in this case, what you do is you um, fit to the architecture 
a corrupted version of your data. Maybe you add, typically you add some noise. So let's say we would like to have uh, some, we'd like to learn features which are maybe uh, robust to some uh, kind of uh, problems, uh, transformations that we expect will be challenging for our task. Maybe in for tracking that would be like some noise from the camera, or maybe like some different changes changes of view views from the from the object. So and in this case, we should actually be able to generate it uh, synthetically. And we would like the network to predict at the output um, the clean version of, of our um, of our bonding box or object to be detected. Yeah, so this, this is not this uh, quite classic architecture for deep neural networks. So the input data X, XI, uh, as we know it, because we take half the clean data, we corrupt it, and then we expect the network to clean it up. We can do this neural network and we can learn some features that might be useful for any other task. Among one of these tasks, this, the task could be object tracking, which is in this case, in which they use this um, denoising autoencoder to learn features. And then later, um, these features that were learned, the features that were learned from the encoder, were used um, uh, as part of a particle filter, which is a popular, uh, let's say, standard technique for object tracking, which is not actually really deep, deep learning. But in this case, it was uh, used just for the particle filter to um, particle filter contains a magnetic classifier in this architecture. But this classifier was actually uh, solved with a neural network and it was pre-trained with the out encoder that I that was shown in the previous slide. There was also another uh, popular initiative on trying to use uh, deep neural networks in this case, and actually deconvolutional neural networks for object tracking, uh, which was inspired by uh, the work presented in this slide. So there was a work uh, focused on still images that kind of explore how the convolutional filters, which are learned in a deep convolutional network, which is trained for image classification, so trained so that given an image, the output will just predict one label. Uh, in this case, it was trained on ImageNet. So this means that it was trained to predict across uh, 1,000 different object categories. So these features that were learned uh, could be used. Uh, oh, sorry, some of these features that were learned could be used as kind of weak object detector. So some of the convolutional filters on um, some of the layers of the convolutional layers of let's say uh, an AlexNet or VGG network uh, could be used in as object detectors. So in this world, they actually like look at which neuron, uh, let's say, yeah, which convolutional ne neurons would have high activations correlated with uh, some of the object classes that wanted to be of interest and that's this what they observe. So based on this uh, previous finding in which like that using convolution of filters and the outputs of these filters in intermediate uh, layers of the, the CNN, uh, we could obtain something interesting. There was this work uh, for uh, tracking, object tracking, in which they actually also look at the outputs of different convolutional layers of a, a network pre-trained on ImageNet. And in particular, they observe that in COM53 uh, of a VGG network, that was really good to detect the objects of interest they were looking. So they were looking at, at people. And that if they combine this uh, COM53 uh, layer with the feature from another layer, and they really did like a handcrafted uh, analysis of the network to find specifically which of these uh, layers would work best. So if you combine this COM53 to detect people, with a COM43 to find units, so, so to, to actually recognize uh, which, if, if the person that it, so which person is being tracked, by combining both, you could have like a, an object tracker with features, uh, let's say initialize with ImageNet training. So in the next slide, you can see uh, 
the complete architecture. So you would have we would have um, a new uh, input frame to be detected, and then so you fit the frame in the, into the VGG. You extract features of different layers on the uh, upper part of architect architecture. That would be the the part of the method that would be fine tuned dynamically for this specific object that we want to track, while uh, in the bottom part, this what's called the general network, uh, that would be a network that would be specialized in detecting people, not any person in particular. So they cut these two uh, layers, one of them fine tuned or let's say online learning uh, for this sequence, another one totally off the shelf and with fixed weights. And then the outputs of the two networks, they proposed uh, also again, a handcrafted algorithm to decide when to choose one or, or the other. So actually when the network was lost and they know well, if, what, what to follow, it would follow a person. If it was very confident that the, that the frame uh, to be analyzed contained an instance of the, of, of the person that for which, for which it had been trained, then it would uh, look at the, the upper branch. So anyway, uh, this was like in the early times of uh, object tracking, but still uh, worthy to, to mention. Later on, um, there were like um, some works that exploited the concept of correlation filters. Let's look at this concept and let's see what, what it means. So correlation filters have been used for uh, object tracking um, much before the neural networks. So actually it's like a concept that was already existed. And then it was found a way to uh, improve it or exploit neural networks as learning to learn these correlation filters. Let's let's first uh, just try to look at the concept of what the correlation filter is. Let's assume again that we um, have a new frame in which we don't know. Uh, so we want to 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 see where where the object that we are tracking is located and to draw a bounding box over it. And in this case, just notice that first it already finds something called the search region. So this this process, uh, although it's optimized, it's a bit um, computationally intensive. So you don't look around the whole image, and actually you you, you also know that the objects will not change will not change a lot between video frames. So it's it makes a lot of sense just to have a search region. Okay, wait, have a pointer. Okay, so we have the search region, and then. Then if we just focus on this search region, that this would be like a region that you would define uh, near the location of the object in the previous frame. So this, this crop area would be like, let's say handcrafted as well, based on the previous detection. We, you would uh, have a filter, it's called the correlation filter. And this correlation filter would model the object that um, we want to detect. So that this is the information Of, of the, let's in this case, the appearance of, of the object should be uh, that it's being tracked. So this filter, you actually compute the correlation so, uh, over over the region. Um, so this operation of the correlation, if you're not familiar with it, basically it's like trying to have the best uh, matching position. So this commercial filter, maybe the picture is very large, but just uh, you could just uh, scan it all over the search region and try to see where it fits the most, right? And for each position in which for which you would center the correlation filter, you would have a response. And if the response, that's what you have on D, be larger when filter would be much better. So so under by the correlation to think about it. This is a very popular uh, operation correlations in the field of signal processing, which basically like to, to see if signals are, are 
very similar, and especially if there's a shift between them, and it's actually what we are looking at. So maybe we have uh, uh, the object, in this case, this basketball player, maybe in the previous frames, probably it was having a different pose, but maybe the, the, the hands were, um, maybe, maybe it, of course, maybe it was displacement with respect to the previous frame, and that's what we're trying to to capture. So we're trying to find the displacement, or like where, where to look next, where to, we're going to draw the bonding box next, and of, and of course, pixels will not be exactly the same as the previous frame, but then we just we look at the, the position in which we have a, a best match for the pattern. This is what you have here, like a filter response. Tomboard is going to, based on the peak, that's where we center um, the bounding box. So this will be like the, the new uh, the new position of the object in, in the in the new frame, right? So this will be like the out the outcome of the of um, in a general setup. What you would do as well is like as you now we have like a new uh, instance of the object being tracked. This would uh, allow to update a correction filter so that in the next frame this correction filter is aware of the new appearance and position of the object. So this is like a very generic concept, not specific from the learning. Let's see how this can be uh, exploited by deep neural networks. So similar as in many other, other tasks for computer vision, the first, the first thing that, uh, that it was tested is like, okay, what if we look at the filters that have been uh, learned with ImageNet, and again, in this case, with a VGG network, and, and use them as if they were correlation filters. That's it, like off the shelf with, with no training at all. And in this world, they run a study and they realize that uh, the filters in the first layer of a VGGM actually were the, the best ones to be used as correlation filters for the, for the task. So using like basically, uh, so b before, before this work, these correlation filters were uh, initially manually designed, like uh, the like to replace these manually designed filters with these filters learned from ImageNet, which have seen to be very beneficial in, in multiple computer vision tasks. So see here the results in which um, these convolutional feature uh, filters on, in red, uh, they obtain the best results. Even just that, even if they were uh, trained, learned from ImageNet. Of course, uh, the next step was okay. So if 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 the convolutional filters we have on on, on CNNs can be useful for um, tracking, let's let's exploit the power of deep neural networks to learn these filters. Not let's not use them. Of the shelf, but let's uh, try to learn them. And then there was this other work, CFNet, in which they they did exactly this. Say so they have uh, in this case here they, they call it like image, which would be the object of interest. They would fit like this image through a CNN. Um, you have the frame in which we want to detect the object. So this is it will be the, the frame of in which we want to detect the object. And in this example. Uh, they are considered that actually the object appears in two locations in in the green location in the purple location so we fit let's say like the two images it's that there seems to be a volume but it actually it refers to the three channels of rgb we fit them through the cnn uh, network that's going to be like common for both of them we take at some point uh, some tensor and that's at this point is when there's uh, some filters that we will learn um from from this um from this tensor and then um they are crop over the 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 area of the object of interest and they are cross so the the filters learn here cross correlated let's say so the activations are on the on the on the crop they you have the you run the cross correlation across the tensor of the frame that we are analyzing so the idea is that 
again so the the patterns of of the activations of in this uh, tensor which are used as cross uh, as correlation filters whenever you have the best matches you have a maximum a peak peak value which is in this case you see in green and and, and in purple they, they correspond they refer to the to the locations in okay so again now the filters actually in this case they are a crop of over the tensors so around the object of interest and these are like the, the commercial filters you can uh, compute the cross, cross correlation um, in this uh, spirit later there was a, a, a another extended work in which um, they were not so they were they proposed an architecture that was uh, trained in a multi-objective task let's say this architecture that you see here uh, from T, so you type the commercial feature, feature maps this rpn means the region proposal network so that's the one that was used uh, for faster cnn with the road, road poolings so it means that you uh, look at uh, some regions of interest and on these regions of interest you can you compute the classification for the classes of, of the objects as well as some regression of bounding box to adjust it to the image so that's so this will be like if you look at this branch this will be like the very classic um, and standard architecture for object detection which is something that you can also run if you are you're comparing pairs of frames and both frames so on across these uh, towers you have the see that detect the detection task and on the other hand um, now uh, we are going to compare the activations so like similar to the to the previous one in which we were like extracting activations from this tensor and use it as commercial filters and see where there was a the highest match then that will be the position of the object the activations from both sides from both towers and in this case um predict which how how would this uh, bonding box be regressed just to the the correct max like what will be so in this case the tower should predict uh, how to uh, regress to get the bonding box uh, on the next frame how to how to do this transformation so which would which would correspond to the to the tracking part and that's why this work was called detect to track and track to detect because actually we're solving like the detection part uh, so the classification regression but for it would be like for a faster cnn approach with the part but least for tracking because you see later i will get back to get back to this idea that actually tracking can be understood as a bounding box regression so just keep that in mind because this will come back later here actually it's like a, the same architecture as earlier but with uh, some ex examples we have two concept frame of well, space uh sorry in time you extract the conversion of features we get commercial features at some layer uh, there they try different layers and over here and over here you, you try to detect the the bounding boxes so just detections here on top are the ones in red the ones in blue if we have a data set which which is annotated we can compute losses in, in both cases detection losses and in addition we want to predict the shift let's say the regression that it would take to go from uh, this bounding box of the objects in frame t to the bounding boxes on the objects on t plus and again if we have a data set with all the information annotated that i think that we can predict with the outputs of these cross cross correlations and define a loss with that okay notice though that uh, to do that we need to have a data set annotated for object tracking which is uh, quite 
um, expensive to to obtain because we need to draw bonding boxes across many frames and that's a tedious task okay let's uh, follow this idea of POC regressor as i mentioned earlier that's going to be a concept that will uh, that's important for tracking and let's look at this uh work called go turn which is also quite popular in which they actually took like the concept of bonding box regression to the limit in this case let's let's see what we have so we have two frames we want to uh define detect the face of uh, this person on the current frame and um in the previous frame somehow it was initialized when it comes from a error detection we know that we want to track this so our goal is tracking this face from the previous frame into the current frame so what do we do first thing as we know the location of what we want to track on the previous frame so we want coordinates of these bonding boxes we're going to take these coordinates of these bonding boxes over the current frame and crop that region and that's this is the the crop we have here right and that's what's called the search region now we'll have uh again like a two tower commercial architecture like a service uh, architecture in which our network what it's going to predict is in this search region um where where is this phase located that's that's kind of the the goal so actually like the search is uh, larger that that we want to to, to so just notice that actually the object that we want to detect is just the face right so actually say in the in the previous frame would have like the face would be over here we manually extend so we, we extend the 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 region the crop to a larger dimension than, than just the the face and then so this extended uh, area is what we crop also in the current frame so by doing that we allow uh that the network learns to regress a bonding box so you you, you can you can think that okay when i say regress you can think that 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 what the network is doing is re regressing a bonding box uh that it could be like the the uh, the out the outer frame of the crop into the bonding box that actually adjust to the object that it's being tracked in this case the the face so this uh so apart from working pretty well the one of these um advantages of this system is that it's very fast just uh, the authors they managed to run it at 100 frames per second later there was uh this extension that kind of follows the same idea of uh regressing uh the bounding box so uh so now you see you have uh like two images across the same one and then you predict uh like a regression so you want to to, to work out this in, in the new frame so these are will be the, the new coordinates they use some just something new that they use they use some skip connections that's something that has been used uh, since unit just to uh, so the network can have a, a higher precision special precision resolution and what it's what wait and what it's novel here it's that uh sorry it's this uh, arrow you see here which which corresponds to um a recurrent neural network what it means it means that the this last is doing the bounding box regression remembers uh what was the operation what was the regression that it was done in the previous uh, frames so let's say if if somehow let's say if the object is moving to the right uh it will probably move to the right for several frames so by adding this recurrency layer which means like a recurrent layer means like a memory 
uh, the, this layer has a potential to remember that as it was moving to the right in the last frames, it will probably move to the right as well in the next frame. And that's the kind of the, the potential. Uh, just notice that in the previous one, uh, there was no recurrency here. So each pair of frames was was treated totally independently. So there was no possibility for, for having this kind of reasoning on about uh, where the object was moving with respect to the camera in the previous frames. Okay. Let's go now for the main uh, part because this tracking by detection is actually the most popular paradigm nowadays. That's it. This is the, the main idea. Um, the tracking by detection paradigm for uh, object tracking starts by firstly considering each frame independently and running any state-of-the-art object detector on it. Let's say it could be like a faster RCNN, SSD, YOLO, uh, master RCNN, if you also want segmentations, whatever. Okay, you just run them frame by frame. Once you have the, the detected objects on your frames, then the task is to link uh, detections um, to form the trajectories. So you want that this man that was detected in these three frames should um, should be linked. Okay, this this one has the same ID. Yeah, and that's basically the idea. So we by doing that, there's something very very important and interesting here is that um, in order to train first part, we can exp we can make use of data sets of on annotated on still images, and that saves makes things a bit more easier than just really needing uh, to have huge amounts of uh, data sets uh, for object tracking where all the frames are annotated. Okay, let's see. Um, so for object detection for the first part, that's uh, the story it's been covered in, in our lectures. Uh, so now let's spend a how to do the, the link between the detection because that's what what was interesting. And you see here there are like different approaches that I chose. So the first and maybe the one that has received uh, uh, more interest from the literature is to uh, learn some features that allow comparing the object that we want that we want to track with all the candidate objects for matching in such a way that we can assign we can do an assignment to the to the to the to the candidate that whose features are more similar to the object we are tracking at this at, the, at each time so for example consider here that you have a frame t and you, you run all the you run object detector you have like all these say, candidate detection whatever they, they mean here right and then uh we know that as a reference the object that we want to track is this car over here so maybe it's small but it's a car and what we like we like to compare somehow the features of this car in with the feature of each detected detected object in frame we're going to process and just take a candidate that minimizes the similarity between the, the picture from the, our reference with uh, one of these detected objects or object candidates in this case. And then by doing that, we can choose um, the, the right object to the right candidate to the tracking. And there, this has been uh, explored for a, from different perspective. Probably the most um, the most popular one is by using SEMIS networks. So SEMIS networks is an architecture that has been used for multiple applications uh, to learn features. And basically here the idea is that you train, uh, in this case, the CNN. So and the and then you show to the network like pairs. So pairs of the same object with, in this case, different views, the time steps, with the with some other uh, 
press new right uh, you uh, the CNN extract in this case you you want them to be the same in this case you, we consider we are using that for classification they are both sneakers so we want them to be close and as this is sneakers this is a bike you want them to be uh, far away in the distance so that this, this gives you a signal uh, enough to train to learn the weight of the of the CNN that's what we want here you have another uh, perspective of the same problem um, so let's say we have a, an anchor that's the object we want to learn for and we look for positive pairs so here is there's this basketball player that's the same basketball player but maybe from another he has a pair here um, you feed them to the same neural network and this representation that you learn at some stage of the network you want it to be similar so you make them close together in the in the feature space on the other hand if you compare it to another player you and that's 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 the basic of metric learning used for retrieval used for a thousand applications also used for tracking and actually like uh, in, in many works for example in this work 2016 they approach they adopted this 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 approach to learn uh features that would later allow to solve the uh, tracking by detection to solve the, the, the assignments for the detection of it by detection. This other work actually did something quite similar, but it also considered um, some additional features apart from the appearance, like the position and the size, um, and that with that, they obtain an increase of performance. If you are familiar with, with metric learning, you will also know that there are other architectures for uh, learning, for metric learning, for example, with the triple loss, which actually takes in, into consideration at the same time, the positive and negative uh, pairs, and that has also been tested in this concept, content of uh, object tracking. This triple loss became very popular in computer vision field from this work called FaceNet, uh, because they really improve performance in uh, face recognition by training it with uh, an anchor positive and negative example um, in this case you see now there are like three terms for the for the loss and that uh, has shown that some gains and again now it will be like the same example earlier uh, with these uh, basketball players you do at the, at the same time you, you compute the loss uh, when you compute the gradients you could compute them at the same time to to have the anchor closer to the positive and farther away to the negative that's the basic idea Another option uh, for learning features will be useful for the tracking uh, by detection. It's to learn features that uh, are aware of the temporal evolution of actually of the appearance. In this case, it could be of, of something of the else, maybe the position, the, the position or, or the size, whatever. But it, that they are, they kind of have some memory of, of how uh, about the evolution of the, of the object being tracked. And then that's something you can do by uh by encoding the features with a an rnn or well, in this case in lstm so with a recurring neural network that has the potential to um, aggregate the temporal evolution of the, of the features in this case that that's what they did in in this work okay one of the most popular algorithms nowadays is the, the one that's coming uh, next and again it's based on um, exploiting the neural networks and architecture that has all been already been trained for object detection and which has benefit from uh, large data sets of, uh, for object detection for supervised learning. So in this case, uh, maybe um, people are not that aware that uh, in faster CNN, which is like this very popular um, architecture two-stage object detection architecture uh, there's one first stage in which uh, the, the network uh, the proposal, proposal network proposal so a huge amount of uh, bounding boxes where the objects could could uh, be and then there's the these region proposals they are fed into a second stage from the connected layer that 
everybody knows that uh, at, the, at the very end there's there are some class probabilities um, but actually um, the network also um, adjusts the bounding boxes um, to be to really uh, to 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 improve the the region proposals okay so the idea here is to exploit the potential of, of this faster ascending uh, architecture to regress bounding boxes. Let's see how it works. So first, um, this work is called Tractor. And what it does, it's the following. So let's assume that we have this object in T minus one, and we have this new frame, red, in type T. The first thing that the that the algorithm does is that it takes this location of the object in the reference frame. So we already have this because remember that in object tracking we always start um, with with uh, some initialization of, of an object. So this was the object, and we take like this, and we just map them same coordinates in the next frame in frame t. So the coordinates from t minus one go into the into the frame. And now, when we get there, we fit this bounding box. So a bounding box from frame t minus one on frame t, and we add a regressor from faster CNN to adjust the bounding box. And that's what it's doing at this point. And with that, that's it. We have already adjusted. We are already we're already tracking the object, and actually, with that with no need of training with any object tracking data set, which is very, very interesting. Um, later, uh, what could happen? It could also happen that, uh, that it's not, it's not the case here, but maybe uh, in, the new, in the new frame, that object is not there. So in this case, there's also the classifier. Um, and now it's adapted to say okay to predict that maybe the, the object is not there anymore. and in that case what you do is you, you kill the track and that's a way to kill the track when the object disappears in addition as faster cell also has the potential to detect new objects, what you are going to do is we're going to uh, run uh, the detector on frame uh, G so we have all the the did objects. We have the objects with uh, with all the bounding box which have already been regressed. So, and if there's one of these bounding boxes uh, that was that is detected, but does not correspond to any of the bounding boxes that have been regressed, in this case would be like the this. Uh, I think it's a little yellow that. Uh, that it was not it's not in t minus one right. so now as the detector could detect this lady would say hey there's a, uh, an object here it was not it was uh, not in the previous uh, frame but so now here i create a new tracklet so in the next frame it will already be here and get, will be tracked to the next frames this is a very neat and, and fast uh, solution that allows doing object tracking with training data for object detection. What else could you do with that? Um, if we if we remember what we did earlier with RNNs, they have the potential to remember the evolution. Uh, actually, we could combine this with an RNN, and this would have the potential to maybe um, remember the objects after an occlusion. Just just notice that. Um, by default, if you don't do anything else, that like what I expre explained here, um, we are only comparing pairs of comp consecutive frames here. So if one of the objects gets occluded, just uh, look at this lady here. So this lady at this point, at this point behind uh, this gentleman over here. So it's very difficult that that lady is even detected, let's say. Um, but if how um, 
have the potential to remember the, the tree of, of the lady was following here and also the, the appearance of it with an RNN, um, it's possible to recover the, the track. Okay, so actually this work is what we are working on this in, in our team. It does, uh, it exploits the potential, the capabilities, the capabilities of RNNs to, of memory to solve the, this kind of challenges. Another way to address tracking by detection is by uh, using a graphical model. So, and again, this is uh, one of these models that has been intensively used much before deep learning. Here, the idea is like, uh, we have the detected objects. We model each object uh, on each frame with a node in a graph. In this case, now we connect just to, uh, we initialize the graph with all the possible connections between all the detected objects. And we know that at the end, uh, there should only be like one path for each object, right? So there's there should be some graph atomization algorithm that's going to filter out uh, all these mm, full, fully connected into uh, single path tracks. So as I mentioned earlier, this has been uh, exploited a lot um, in the literature from classic techniques. And just very recently, so it's will be presented in the next CAPR, uh, this work from the team from Laura Leal at, at Munich managed to uh, actually formulate this graph partitioning uh, into a learnable manner, so it can be trained end-to-end -end with excellent results. Also in this idea of end-to-end, -end, this very same team um, kind of extended this initial effort from uh, some years ago from Anton Milan on trying to really um, solve object tracking with RNN. At this point, it, this, this solution had some drawbacks, but also like um, recently, and also to be presented in the next CAPR, the same team of Munich managed a way to uh, solve the assignment of, uh, of IDs between objects across frames with something called they call the deep Ungarian net. So the Ungarian algorithm actually it's an algorithm that optimizes the uh, assignments uh, between, let's say, sets in a global manner. So they managed to formulate that in a differential manner and and really improve a lot the, the performance, well, to improve the performance of the on multiple object tracking. Just to finish, just some curiosity, because that's what we are very interested in our research group. There's also these uh, works in which, instead of uh, providing a bounding box of uh, for the first frame to track the object, what you provide is a linguistic description. Okay, so for example, in the in the first one, it says a woman with ponytail running, and that's it. That's all the that's all the um, information that's provided to the algorithm. So there's no bounding box that to be tracked. There's only a linguistic description of the object, which improves a lot the uh, the interaction between humans and machines in order to solve this this kind of problems. And this problem was also addressed recently in this paper from. WACB. Okay, so we have completed the, an overview of the state of the art for multi, uh, object tracking. Just that if you are interested, I suggest that you look at the section of papers with code called multiple object tracking, as well as the forthcoming uh, CAPR workshops, the MOT challenge, the ICT challenge. And I think that there's no more of the third workshop, but you can still look at the the one the edition from last year to see what's the latest state of the art. Here are some words that I didn't have time to mention, but you might want to take a look at it. But you see that it's a very active and exciting field. Also, if you have problems or uh, questions about deep learning in general, as I invite you to look at the online courses we have from our UPC Telecom Barcelona School. Thank you very much. And now, if there's a course online, I'll be available for questions for you. Thank you very much.